So hello, everybody, and welcome to Textile Medley. My name is Dana Leah, and I am a white woman with short brown hair and blue glasses with some long purple and orange uh, earrings. I'm sitting in a bedroom with a bunch of different kinds of art arrayed around me. Um, I am also the program manager for Intertwine Arts, the organization that is hosting this talk today, which is a nonprofit whose mission is to inspire creativity, joy, and self-confidence through freeform weaving for people of all ages with disabilities or chronic illness. Now, today we are here for Textile Medley, which is a lunchtime artist talk series that Intertwine Arts is hosting over the summer, where we highlight amazing artists with textile practices and influences alongside the amazing textile artists that we Intertwine Arts have on staff. Some people may or may not know that we recently went through a renaming from Sayori Arts NYC to Intertwine Arts. And this series is sort of a part of that change. While we remain weaving focused, we love to encourage and dip our toes into a range of fiber mediums, techniques, and tools that allow everyone to express their tactile creativity in ways that are accessible for disabled and chronically ill artists. Today, for the last in the series, we are interweaving the arts practices of Alex Goldberg and Brandy Godsill. Um, so we are going to start off with Brandy sharing her work for roughly 15 to 20 minutes. Uh, then Alex will share her work for around 15 to 20 minutes. And then after that, Brandy and Alex will discuss some of the commonalities and divergences in their work and experiences. Uh, and this will then be followed by a short Q&A if we find we have the time for it. Yeah. And so then I'm going to pass it off to Brandy to introduce herself and get started. Great. Thank you so much, Analia. Thank you, everyone, for coming. My name is Brandy Godsell. I am a half Japanese, half American woman with long, wavy, dark hair. And I'm wavy, wearing an orange and green weaving tunic and have a white background. So really excited today. I am co-founder of Intertwine Arts and experimental fashion designer and textile artist. And I'm really excited to share some of my work with you, both past and a lot of work that I've created during residencies this year. So I'm going to share my screen. So I am a graduate of the Maryland Institute College of Art. I received my BFA in fiber arts in 2009. And this is one of my pieces for my thesis in 2009 called The Cosmic Dance. So I was always really interested in performing arts, costume, fashion, um, but also where those garments can live, kind of a setting. And I created a video piece and installation for my thesis. So I'm going to go somewhat in chronological order, but also kind of jump around as well. But um, it's interesting to look back at some of my work even over 10 years ago and see a lot of reoccurring themes and concepts that are so relevant to my work today. So I collaborated with dancers for this piece and made all the garments by hand and hand dyed them and was always looking at different surroundings and really interested in <laughs> buildings and places that had a lot of history and life to them, but also abandonment as well. So here's another still from that. And these were two students that also went to Micah that were dancers that I worked with. And so here are some images and close-ups of these. Sometimes I'll model the garments myself because my background is in dance is one of my earliest art forms as well as music, piano playing, but then I was always drawing as well. And so I was interested in a lot of different art forms, but fashion and, and garment is definitely what I focus on. So this is one of my first Sayuri weavings. So after I graduated, Mike, I went straight to New York and then was working in the fashion industry for over 11 years, but I wanted to go back to my love for textiles. And so I discovered Loop of the Loom Studio. Some of you may know of Loop of the Loom um, that is in the Upper East Side and also in Dumbo. And so I'll always look back at some of my first Sayuri weavings with fondness and think about the experience that I had on the looms and how revolutionary really was for me and I know for a lot of other people so this is a garment one of the first garments that I made with Suri weavings and I call this a story of us because I know I remember that when I was weaving it's such an intuitive process and very 
subliminal and I was thinking about my relationship with my partner and thinking about different color themes and how that can represent almost like as characters for a certain narrative or my own personal experience. So here's a dress that I made mainly of blue yarn and warps with a pink shape near the torso that's intersecting with a blue shape and they're kind of they're intertwining together. And it's a long dress with a slit on the side and kind of has somewhat of a boat neck and it's sleeveless. And then here's another Sari Wilton piece. So one, well, some of you may know about Sari, but I'll just quickly describe it. It's a philosophy where it literally translates to Zen weaving. Sa, meaning everything has its own integrity and ori, meaning weaving. And sustainability is a huge part, I think, of, of Sayori and also when you're making garments with them as well. So thinking about a lot of times kind of origami style, using minimal waste, having only a certain amount of cuts. There's no rules to it, but just being very mindful and conscious of and also being into the earth subconscious levels, but how to create something without using a whole lot of waste. So I made this skirt based on that philosophy. And I was always drawing, like I was saying as well. Like, so during my childhood, I have vivid memories of drawing pastels with my mother and just working constantly in my sketchbooks. I always tell my students I teach here in North Carolina. That's where I'm based now. I live in Raleigh, North Carolina. That it's just really important to, to keep a sketchbook. And more in my younger years, I would draw almost every day and just almost like keeping like a visual diary in a sense it's not meant to be on display necessarily you can eventually if you need to use it for your portfolio etc but it's really for you and to look back on these different ideas and they may come to become three-dimensional pieces sometimes they don't for me um, but I was thinking about sculptures and textiles and textures and a lot of times creating something where there's many, many parts to make a whole. So this is a, I just really like this kind of sculptural form. And there was a period where I was obsessed with cocoons. I was just always wanting to wrap the body in fabric and material. So here's this kind of cocoon-like organic shape with lots of different colors within it. And then a detail of using marker, of kind of like a, a grid, so some of them maybe not as organized. <laughs> not just with don't always ignore it. You red know, attending classes who are red shapes and green shapes within it and white shapes. And there's some other images in my sketchbook. So always relating to the body because that's what I'm particularly interested in and how can a garment express a concept. And that's the challenge a lot of times of of doing a lot of research, but then how can I make that in a three-dimensional form? And then for it to be quote unquote wearable, but when I say wearable, it doesn't mean that you're necessarily gonna walk down the street and go to the market with where you're wearing, you could, but that's not always the main purpose of it, but being really experimental with what I'm making. So these are some of the research boards of a project I was working on. And looking back at these boards, I think how often I will, kind of compartmentalize in a sense these ambitious projects and break them up into stages. So this concept was thinking about the cycle of life. So birth, childhood, adulthood, and then ultimately death. And that's something that I keep going back to and it's such a broad concept, but within each of those stages, there's so much that I can explore within that. So I think sometimes I, I'll work from more of a general idea and then get more specific with it and then to make a three-dimensional form with that. So this board was gathering a lot of research and mixing my drawings without using primary and secondary research of images that I've taken or of other work that I'm inspired by. And then sometimes writings or poems that I've read and just collecting, I'm a very eclectic researcher and just keeping a lot of these because I would say for me, it's better to have too much than not enough because then I can always refer back to my research or things that I've been exploring later. So I kind of have this big pile of collages and things like that that I keep and then I can go back to it. So this one was thinking about childhood 
and creation of, of humans. So becoming a particular identity, everyone, you know, you get a name, you become something that is three-dimensional in the world. And then this thinking about that transition kind of more to childhood and, and the elements of play and exploring. And look, I'm always really fascinated with nature and looking at those natural forms as inspiration and so architectural forms as well. And then this board, this is a drawing that I made, you can see kind of on the right. So I'll grab images from my sketchbook and then sometimes looking at garments that other people have made or more sculptural forms and using that as inspiration, never copying them, of course, but maybe there's some emotion that I'm getting from looking at an image and that translates well to my concept. Um, so here's kind of a collage of stills of films that I'm really inspired by and text, I have the word permanent. So always really exploring what these, these ideas are in my mind, right? So then from there, getting a lot of research images, but then creating garment collages with them. So I have three garment collages here on the page where they have cutouts of different squares around and then really quick gestural drawings, experimental drawings of figures, but really not overthinking it. And that's definitely a parallel with the story weaving that I do too, is just working with your intuition and trusting yourself, which I think is something really hard sometimes to do, but also easy at the same time if you just let go. So letting go of the control and trusting your hand that it's going to create something that is unique to you. Um, so I work, so these are really quick experiments um, and drawing and collages that I can then take and maybe certain ideas and forms within that collage and then use that for the physical three-dimensional piece. So the middle is an image of a red kind of historical costume like dress with, dress with a rough, a rough, rough a Um and then a drawing of a figure. And I'm always looking at different materials too and just collecting a lot of things. It could be a piece of paper towel with charcoal on it that maybe I was using. And I say, oh, there's something interesting about that kind of texture. And so with my textile background, I'm always looking at those textures. So the image of, I think this was in the subway maybe in New York City with the tiles, the white tiles and then cutting them out into a circle and then um, drawing these sort of expressive images and lines around. So I was thinking about energy, like how do how do these, whether it's a person or um, it could be a material to what energy is it evoking, exuding? So here's some more collages as well. So a lot of these are from the board um, research images that I had. And then these are some other images of the different snake kind of spiral effects that I was interested in and the fingerprints and then translating that into a textile piece of just working with basic yarn, crocheting and really letting go and listening to what that material wants to do. So it's a balance, I think for me, of imposing my will on a material, but also listening to it as well. And so it's that back and forth and then sometimes not really forcing it and then it's taking form so these are just kind of more like studies. And then some of my sketches, these are lots of different color blocks. So red, blue, orange, and just doing basic crocheting strips. I was just really interested in crocheting, though that's not my background. So all I could do is just strips of crochet. <laughs> that's all I can do still. But, you know, just exploring with it and having fun with it and then seeing what forms and then it created this collar that was really structured. And I thought, oh, that's kind of interesting. Let me drape it on my body. I love to, I'll drape on the mannequin and I think it's much stronger and I have more of a relationship to the material when it's draped either on myself or on another person because you have that, that live body underneath. And this is a, another piece that is all wool roving dyed with avocado skins and black beans to get this purple color. And then the avocado skins and the pits are the, the orange. So I I love exploring with natural dyes. It's really fun. So this is kind of like a bib structure 
and it's open and it's held together with Elmer's glue. So it was this really intuitive process of just taking forks and making it really sculptural and then it hardens to create this form. This is on my body. And then some other images of my sketchbooks. So different ideas that I have looking at, at myths and fairy tales. And then using, this is a rag rug. I keep so many scraps of fabrics. I'm sure a lot of textile fiber can relate to this. <laughs> Lots of baskets, now we're in a baskets and containers of scraps. And then was braiding them and then sewing them. These are all sewn by hand and then created this dress with it. So it's this gradation of blues and blacks and then to becoming a lighter dress. And this was featured in Cosmopolitan Magazine in Kazakhstan, 2017. So this year I did a few residencies that were really incredible and that I highly recommend and really helped me grow as an artist. And I was focusing on this ambitious project that I'm still working on, I may be working on this for years, called the Stages of Grief. So this weaving is a life-size weaving that's made with a lot of indigo dyed yarn and wool, chunky wool yarn, but it has a lot of openings within the weave, weaving and the warp, and it's on this big frame loom. So this I made in Oaxaca, Mexico residency that was part of a group called Thread Caravan and the studio is called Tushere and they have wonderful ceramic textile lots of different workshops so they have these residencies that you you can go to this is my first residency and this is in January and it was really wonderful just to be able to learn about the artisans in that area but then also have an open studio time so when I went there I wanted to focus on a particular stage. So like I was saying earlier with these really broad concepts, then each residency that I did, I it was a way for me to compartmentalize in a sense and narrow down what I was going to focus on. So looking at these different fibers and being able to work on a really large scale, I was thinking about the depressive stage in the stages of grief and how a lot of times I, in my own personal relationship to these stages, so everyone's gonna have their own experience, but it's also universal. So I was thinking about depression as can feel sometimes like a blanket that I just kind of want to sit in, but there's also these holes within that and this sort of melancholic um, feel to that, but a delicacy to it. So I started draping the weaving in my body and then took images of it, but. It can also exist as a, a hangings, wall hanging. Um, so I definitely plan to explore these stages more, but within the, the constraints of the time frame, it's a really good way for me to just produce work and be exploring and exploring and then creating a finished piece and then eventually making more pieces for each stage and then combining them as well. So in May, I did a residency in Iceland at the Icelandic Textile Center, which is absolutely incredible. And they also have a new textile lab where they have 3D printers, laser cutter, laser engraving machines, a felt loom, a knitter machine. I mean, it's just really, really amazing. It's open to the public. Um, and you just can go in and reserve time to use the machinery. So that was for a month in May this year. And I was working with the Icelandic wool and learning about the landscapes, which is absolutely incredible. And the nature is just so inspiring. So I focused on the stage of bargaining with this, this residency. So when I was thinking about bargaining. At first it was thinking about the personal relationship with this. So my mother passed about four years ago and that was a huge inspiration for this whole project and going through a lot of turmoil with personal relationships and just the concept of grieving, grieving expectations as well. Um, it can be small things, it can be large things, it could be deaths. It's just, it's the cycle that is, is part of life and being able to cope with that and be conscious of it as well. Um, and sometimes I think it takes time to have some distance between a really traumatic event to be able to make work about it or to process it. And 
um, and think more cognitively about it. So this uh, particular one oops, no, that's not, yeah, is a wing that I found when I was exploring the shores of Iceland. So like I was saying, the my personal relationship with these stages was the initial inspiration for it. But then when I was walking around the shores, I found hundreds of birds that had died probably maybe the day before. And these are the common mirror birds. And I was really taken aback by this. I mean, I'm sure all of us are conscious of global warming and what is going on with the earth, but it was so direct in this impact that I have. And it was really related to this bargaining stage um, and this relationship to nature. So I started exploring more about using found objects and these animals and kind of creating sort of a memorial, I guess, and pieces that are in remembrance of these, of these creatures. So that's where the laser cut wool came from is it's laser cut of the the shape of the wing and then different fish skeletons is finding I mean there's no way for you not to be connected somewhat to nature in Iceland I mean it's it's just such a beautiful place um but also yeah on this macro scale is is there something that we can do and I think with the bargaining stage for me I think about a sense of hope and sometimes a false hope and that too is there's something that can be done to reverse what has happened um there's just concepts that i've been thinking about these are some fish skin leathers that i use that were engraved with the skeletons and the wings that i found of studies and that's these are knitting samples that i met at the knitterette machine depicting the co2 atmospheric levels and recently the Arctic sea water rising temperatures. And you can see the grid. This is something I I engraved on a piece of wood, just depending how quickly the temperatures of the sea are rising. And these are rectangular samples of knitwear pieces. And it was interesting working on the knitter machine because I never used that before. And it created some runs into the fabric, but I really embrace it. And I actually really love that. Um, so that's very sayuri of some of the quote unquote errors end up being part of the piece and just accepting that. So these are little samples of white, beige, and kind of like an aqua blue. And then I worked with a, another dancer that I met um, that was doing a residency in the town over. And let's see if it's gonna work. And just, exploring some video work with her. So subtle movements, but it's always takes more life when the garments are on a body and in a space too. So, oopsies. so I would like to, my ambition is to create an experimental film depicting all of these stages of grief, but like I said, it will take a lot of time, which is fine. Okay, so then, whoops. I did a summer abroad program at Central St. Martin's in London this summer. And before I even went to London, I knew I wanted to work on the stage of anger. So I was thinking about different cityscapes and also my experience of living in New York City for 11 years. And it's such a completely different pace. There's this sort of uh, vigor and a lot of anger sometimes when you're feeling like there's so many things that you need to do, you're rushing, you're, it's a completely different environment. You're around tons of people all the time. And I just felt like that would be a really good setting for me to explore this stage. So I was gathering a lot of research with, of medieval monks actually in Japan. So I'm half Japanese and half American and my mother's Japanese. And so I was looking at different garments that were worn by monks and also these warrior monks in Japan and was cutting up the research images and exploring different shapes that I could create and pleating them and cutting the pleats 
and just working intuitively. So these are some images of my sketchbook to draping them on my body and documenting as much as possible. I think that's really important. Just taking as many images. It doesn't need to be super polished or perfect or anything. These are studies that will help make the final creation. Um, and it's this back and forth process. So looking at different painters and they're cutting the canvas and the pleats and looking at armor and cages, excuse me. And so you can see an image of this this monk and they would wear these baskets over their head with little slits in the eyes so that they would obliterate their ego. And I thought that was really interesting in the concept of anger because it's almost like the antithesis of it where these monks would go on these really long spiritual excursions and really, uh, I mean, they would basically starve themselves and there was kind of extreme level of what they would do to their bodies. Um, and then from there, also researching these warrior monks, I think I have some images, these are some um, drapings that I did. So here's a warrior monk too. So that kind of, that dichotomy, I thought was really interesting. Like what anger as a, the opposite of tranquility and serenity. So that's where I came up with these concepts of making these pleats and then cutting into them um, to kind of going full circle. And so this is the final garment, but it's a twall. So I plan to make it in, in maybe different variations and final fabric. And it can be worn with, it's actually a pole that I've put in to create the structure of, it's like a bamboo pole to put it, the, make the structure of the shoulder stick out, but it can be worn either way. So yeah, um, that is my talk. And I'm excited to explore these themes further and create a lot more work in the future. So thank you. I'm going to stop my share and then turn it over to Alex. Hi, everyone. I'm really happy to be here to share with all of you. My name is Alex Goldberg. My pronouns are she, her, and I have brown hair and brown eyes, and I'm currently in a white top and in front of a white background. I'm an artist, educator, and healing arts practitioner located in Brooklyn, New York. And I've always been interested in the healing nature of creativity. As a child, I was drawn to art making and dance. I found these practices very soothing. And I now utilize creative practice to enhance self-awareness and shift mental and behavior patterns that are not serving me. This process is in many ways a deconditioning from the constructs that do not serve me while also reconnecting with learning and structures that do. I have come to understand that this process goes beyond my lived experience as some of these patterns that I'm working with are ancestral and generational. And so I choose my medium or more specifically the process for a project because it mirrors the pattern or life experience that I'm working through. And by embodying that process and the purity of creative practice, void of a story in which I can project blame for the hardship. I'm able to simply feel the discomfort in the process and um, the story dissolves and I can live more freely outside the studio, inside the studio and outside the studio. So today I wanna to show you a few examples of projects from my practice and share how I work with others to aid in exploring their own creativity in this way. One of the key functions of my work is to soften the rigid mind. We're conditioned to think in binaries. So like this is this or that, good or bad, safe or dangerous. And when we're in personal conflict, it's also because we have conflicting belief systems that we identify as both sides of the duality and can't make sense of that. So my work deals with processing the notion that these dualities are constructs of our own making. This first project I'm sharing with you is called 100 Days, and it's a journaling and photography project that's displayed as a large hanging mylar scroll. In this work, I studied obsessive mental thoughts, and for 100 days, I notated negative thoughts and then plausible counter thoughts and photographed myself in the process. On one side of the scroll, you can read the negative thoughts and see the backwards positive thoughts. So each side of the scroll exhibits a mental reality. 
the act of writing the negative thought and then flipping the paper to write the counter thought for a hundred days really transformed my perspective. And then a few years later, I revisited this work to explore mirroring these images so that you could see both sides of the dualistic thinking in one image. So with more understanding of the mind, this felt like a clearer representation of the process. If both of the opposites on the page are true, they end up canceling each other out and I'm no longer defined by either. And so I utilize my work to process the unconscious experience and the invisible becomes visible. And through this process, visibility serves as a catalyst for change. In this instance, meditating on these images afforded me more freedom of thought. Um, like Brandy, uh, my first uh, creative expression was also dance. And from dance, I moved to visual art and then into design. And so, um, Later in my career, I uh, became an academic and got a little bit in, disembodied in my perspective. And so this project now called Notes on Yoga was kind of a call to return to understanding and learning from my body's intelligence. So the purpose for this project was to recalibrate the body and mind and make room for my body to speak to my mind rather than my mind bullying my body. As yoga became a regular practice of mine, the body movement began to bring forth insight through my mind. After a yoga class, I would notate these insights and the project became a combination of these notations and illustrations of the insight that arrived. The entirety of this process is a practice that strengthens the relationship between eye, mind, hand, and body. And so this is one of the pages and I'll just read what it says on the page. When the routine changes, it trips me up. I see such value in change, but I find it hard to acknowledge that it can be difficult. That doesn't mean it isn't worth the fight. Today, while wrapping my peace fingers around my big toes, I was reminded how powerful words can be when you use them well and wisely. An invitation to be in fetal position is an invitation to be vulnerable. When I'm able to access vulnerability, I can grow even stronger. I'm beginning to try more challenging things. I tell myself that it is okay. I'm always, I'll, I'll always have my mat to ground me. I know this behavior is spreading far beyond my yoga practice. So after that project notes on yoga, movement became fully integrated into my practice again. I think this is the most macro example of the, the method of deconditioning and relearning that has happened in my practice thus far. And so when I began to move again, I felt a coming home. A big part of this exploration at large, my practice is the belief that transformation, evolution, and change is both something new and a coming home. So this work that we're looking at here is a part of a series of performances where I created garments that allowed me to embody a visualization of an internal blockage. When I'm wearing them, I can see myself inside the blockage and utilize movement to physically transform and shift my perception of the experience. The blockages explored are grief, patience, projection, and reflection. And this garment specifically is about projection. So in this performance, I'm interacting with the space to embody, embody the understanding that I am projecting. And with awareness, I can take responsibility and act from this place. A corresponding work in this series was this piece on reflection. And so here I'm embodying the experience of reflection and mirroring, um, using the, the landscape to experience mirroring. And so when we begin to withdraw our projections, we can exist with more presence and then utilize mirroring and reflection simply to notice rather than judge, which that's a big part of my work also is the um, using creative practice just for the purpose of noticing and not taking it to judgment. And so both of these performances took place on Governor's Island. Um, during a residency with Harvest Works, um, the first one inside their residency house and this one just outside in a puddle outside the house.
So another key function of my work is to find comfort in the unknown by understanding, by embodying the understanding that the only constant is change. And so this is addressed most acutely in facing death and in the process of mourning. With this process came an awareness that as a culture, we are very resistant to change because we don't want to acknowledge death. If we remove the fear of change, we can exist from a place of curiosity. We can experience the unknown as an expansion instead of a contraction. We can experience it as a possibility. So this first garment, this was the first of the series, and this work um, is called Mourning War Her. And in this work, the ripped black ribbons reference Kriya, which is a Jewish tradition where mourners tear a piece of cloth to help confront the reality of death. The act of tearing a dress worth of ribbon to create this costume was cathartic. The weight of the ribbons on my body felt like the physical representation of the mental weight of death. The movement felt vulnerable and free. The garment is constructed so that when I'm standing still, it may, as, it may appear as if I'm in a solid black dress similar to a cocktail dress. Yet when I'm moving in the work, the ribbons are also moving and my body is exposed. A visual and experiential metaphor of the vulnerability and grief. And this other one, Phantom Gown, was created to explore the next phase of the grieving process. It addresses the layers of emotion that exists after an initial mourning period or time of trauma. The feelings may be faint to the feeler or their community, but they're there and layered. Our energy can get tangled in them, sometimes creating a boundary or barrier between the feeler and the world surrounding them, sometimes creating a thread for connection and an opening into transparency. So the layers of fabric and hand spun yarn in this work exist to simulate the feeling of built up emotions. If they aren't flowing through the body, they're all encompassing. So all of these garments were in a way like sketches, they're quick explorations of transformation. In a way they can be considered a ceremony to ignite change. I see the process as similar to clearing a singular blockage in source point, the energy work that I practice. This series um, called Liquid Solid Ice Melt Repeat was actually a much longer process. I worked on this series for about seven years. And this is more of a mirroring of the energetic modality that I work with at large. And so these works are reliant on a series of creative actions and intuitive decisions that are made in the midst of a methodical process. Um, so this work is really about the process. Um, it's also natural dye. I collect food scraps and nature and then make dye, take extractions from that dye and then let the dye condense more, take more extractions. And then um, from those extractions, I freeze ice forms, assemble the ice forms on paper, the ice melts, the liquid dries, the prints are made. I study the prints, I play with the prints and they sometimes bring joy, they sometimes bring angst. I cut up the prints and reassemble them. Collages are made, collages are studied, collages are played with. Sometimes they bring joy, sometimes they bring angst. And really this process occurs to help me see myself with honest eyes, to help me learn the way I act and react and change over time, to help me succeed in true relationship with person, place, or thing. And so this process functions as a mirror of myself outside the studio. It's a way to check in with myself to first acknowledge and then shift patterns that are not aligned with my healthiest expression of self. So recently this summer at a three week residency um, at a wonderful place upstate called Sakuro, I explored the way of working at a larger scale and in a more condensed period of time. Um, and so this intensified the experience and unconscious constructs uh, from greater depths surfaced. And this is me working on one of the installations. Um, I began the residency working on a piece with chicken wire and mirrors. At the time, I thought I was in relationship with the land, but I didn't realize how much force I was exerting. I was projecting a geometry onto the land that was not so inherent and using that as a guide for my installation's form. I was wrestling at the time with my constricting unconscious beliefs of my identity in relation to architecture, ornament, nature, gender, and race. In experiencing challenges with the creation of the work, 
my beliefs were reflected back at me and I was able to observe how these beliefs inhibit creativity to move through me. I put a pause on the first piece that I just was showing you and um, began working on a new piece where the sticks from the site were actually guiding the making. The sticks became the loom on which I used invisible thread and mirrors to highlight their energetic midline. As a more responsive practice emerged with the site, a more honest expression emerged. I hung these works as a moving mobile in the original spot I was drawn to on the trail. This was the highest point of the trail, and I reached the awareness that I had been guided through, guided there to explore the midline within me. The vertical axis that is on one side grounded on earth and on the other side floating in air. Once this piece was hung, I unraveled the original piece, quite literally unraveling the rigid mind. On my way out of the trail with the intention of recycling the material, I spontaneously utilized the material to create a new piece. From this place of curiosity, the work emerged as an entirely new thing. I was able to explore force from a place of acceptance and respect. These strips now ornament a fallen tree in which the energetic force exuding from its cavity is, evidence, is evident. Being in responsive practice with the natural world has been an endless resource for acknowledging change as the only constant and the beauty within this knowing. And so this was my most recent land work, but I've been really interested in land work for a while. And this kind of began with a residency I did in Morocco in 2019 with a place, uh, an organization called Slow Research Lab. And in this residency, I was really inspired by the palm fronds in the oasis where I was working. And so I let go and allowed uh, my desire to interact with them guide me back to my original practice of dance. In the midst of the residency, we took a day off from the oasis and went to the beach. My mother loved the beach and um, she passed away about maybe four years prior to this experience. And so I instinctually wore her top that day that we went. Um, and since then I found that this specific top has the power to bring her forth and that's something I can't explain. But while I was there in this moment where this picture was taken, I wrote, well, this poems came through me that um, I'll read to you all. I wore your top and knew that I would find you here the best version of you. When I reached the water's edge, I cracked my heart open as I had learned from the palm stems and shared it with you. Every day, my legs and feet look more like yours. I slip my foot into the sand and feel yours with mine. As I catch up to you, I promise to accept the changes in full and honor them, not just for my well-being, but for yours and for all of ours. The ocean's power is so strong, it forces us to break the patterns that only yield harm. Your power tossed your soul and ate you up. It was the fastest force I had ever seen. Somehow you saved a bit of that power for me. You, me, and the ocean, we will change the patterns and make space for so much love. And so allowing nature to guide me brought me back to dance. Dance brought me back to poetry. and. Um, it got me into a place of embodied making rather than mental space. And here's a clip from the final performance of this work at the Tisnet Museum of Contemporary Art.
um, in this video, I'm using the palm fronds that I, are in my hands to um, guide me in my movement. So um, I was sort of exploring like how they interacted with my body and how they signaled me to maybe lift my arm in a certain way or um, yeah, they were sort of telling me what to do. I don't think I could do it again now. <laughs> Um, and so last summer at the swimming hole in Woodstock, I continued this type of conversation with nature. And instead of um, using just the one aspect of it, like the palm fronds, I worked with the landscape at large. So here's a clip from that. Um, and so in this video, um, well, it, it, the sound will come on to say what is happening actually, or maybe the sound's not working, but basically I was finding, oh, Oh, okay. I'm hearing from people that you can't hear the sound, so I'll just kind of narrate. But basically, um, what was happening, let me turn it off for me. <laughs> um, basically, what's ha happening in it was that I was living on this beautiful land and taking walks around the land and um, exploring the landscape at large and seeing like, what's the landscape telling me to do with my body? And so in that beginning part, I was it says reach between two trees, they're grounded, they will help you find balance. And in that I was um, using the knowledge of the trees to find balance within my own body. And then I would do that in different parts of the landscape. Um, here I'm tracing the mountain range um, to find harmony. And um, yeah, so that's what this piece was about. And also um, in my teaching practice, I teach um, in, in part of what I teach is interior design. And so I have a real interest in bodies and space. And so this was a study of um, our body in the natural world as well. I'm gonna keep going just for the interest of time. And so in addition to teaching for a few years now, I've been working with individual clients and utilizing um, source point therapy and guided making exercises to aid in activating innate creativity to support health. So this summer I went back to the swimming hole um, with a group of wonderful friends and colleagues of mine and facilitated a collaborative residency where we explored doing these practices as a group specifically in the context of mourning the lives of parents and grandparents. And so that's um, what's pictured here, this different exercises we did. Um, and then I also recently formally launched my healing arts practice, which is called Phenomena Of, and that's a space to do this work um, in Gowanus. And one of the programs I'm offering there is this bi-weekly drop-in uh, meditative arts workshop. And so that's an opportunity um, for people to explore these processes that, I'm, that I've shared with you all in their own way um, to utilize creative practice to gain self-awareness and activate innate creativity. And so this first one was uh, last week and we did drawing, but we'll be exploring different types of practices just like how I do in my practice. Um, and this has just been such an exciting new development for me to be able to make this practice collective. So thank you uh, for listening and for giving me the opportunity to share and reflect on this. Um, that's my chat. Great, thank you so much. Such wonderful work.
Um, so we're going to go into the discussion slash Q&A portion. Feel free to put comments, questions in the chat, uh, but Alex and Brandy and I are going to uh, chat for a bit. Um, if you guys have anything to say first, go ahead. I have lots of thoughts. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think it's so it's been so great to connect with you, Alex, and we met a few times um, before this talk and just to be able to have a conversation about our work and our experiences and a lot of parallels with our background with dance and performing arts and it's and the poetry of your work is just is really gorgeous um I am I'm really interested in so much of it but I in relation to my own work too I think about documentation and how you process that I guess where it's interesting to see different forms of your work for instance the ones within the forest where you have two different images kind of they're transparent in a way and then interacting with each other and then also the one in Morocco with the palms and how much do you think about not so much the movements itself but the documentation and whether you're thinking about an audience as far as the performing arts and whether it's a live performance versus you capturing on film and um I guess how much do you think about that beforehand or is it more during or an aftermath if that makes sense you know is it something like okay yeah. I want to create something where I'm going to put two bodies together and then document them separately or is it more like an intuitive process uh, um that's a great question I think I guess it's on the line of more intuitive um, in the way that it's like, it's just an extension of the process. Most of the time the visual is so that I can, after the fact, see it and continue to integrate the knowledge that came from the process into my being. Um, in the past, it's been, if there's an audience, fine, but it's been more just about the way that it's working for me, it's almost like research to then figure out how to share with others in the future. But now um, I'm getting really interested in the idea of doing more like interactive performance work. And in some ways that's coming out in the way that I create pedagogy for my workshops or for my classes, but also in just more the like fine arts realm, I really would love to see how I can blur the line between um just like the experience and uh reality so just like bring pe other people into what it is that I'm doing but so maybe that's more participatory than audience but that's where I'm thinking about yeah and I also just um want to say it I agree it's been such a joy to do this pairing and I want thanks to Intertwine Arts because that's been such a nice part of this to get to know an art, a like wonderful artist who works in similar themes, but in different ways. And yeah. Yeah, we really, we really tried mm -hmm. to pair people that we thought would complement each other well. Um, and yeah. so we appreciate you guys also getting to know each other too. That's exciting to hear. Um, yeah. And I also wanted to throw it's... in too, funnily, that uh, I actually danced for 10 years. Uh, so dance is something that I also really uh, connect to in your work. Uh, and so I liked seeing that and exploring that. And movement is something that I'd like to incorporate in my stuff. I just don't think I'm there yet. Uh, uh, so I love seeing that. Yeah. Um, I do, uh, yes. we have lots of compliments in the comments. Uh, so thank you all for that. Um, one uh, question we have um, is hearing more about phenomena of and what it's been like uh, to introduce that project into your larger project practice and this is for Alex um yeah it's it's really exciting it's relatively new um in terms of working with individuals it's been um a, a while but now um working it, like collectively in a community space it's a whole new thing and it's kind of like uh this opportunity for a long time to bring together my healing practice and my teaching practice into one space um, to explore embodied practice as a method for healing. And it's 
just I'm so excited about it. Um, and it feels really like that next step of like, how do I bring people into this practice and not saying like, this is how I did it. So you should do it this way, but figuring out how um, this kind of thing can work for other people. And that's been, it's like so inspiring for me and feels really nice to be able to share it with others. Uh, and Brandy also uh, teaches quite a bit as well. Uh, if you want to share sort of how teaching uh, is for you and how it compares to what Alex has expressed. Yeah, absolutely. I I teach with intertwined arts via Zoom and also I was saying teach in North Carolina and taught, to, taught a bit in New York and also teach fashion and textiles in Switzerland for a summer program. And I really love teaching. I think it's such a great way to strengthen my own skills and my process and be able to give back. And it's, I'm constantly learning from my own teaching as well. So being able to, to say out loud all the steps, you know, when it's something technical, but also these, the different processes. So um, yeah. And the age group is really interesting too. I teach a lot of teenagers, which I love. I think I would love doing that, but I do. <laughs> and it's a great way for me to co- connect to my own inner child in my teenage years and, you know, maybe some unfortunate um, events that happened in my childhood and teenage years. But but then to see the joy of my students being able to create. And so it's it definitely helps strengthen my own work. I think someone was asking about that too. And Chapman Studio, Alex, can you talk a bit more about how teaching influenced your body of work and practice? Yeah, I guess kind of like Brandy, what you were saying about how like it's inspiring for your work too, like that feedback loop, I feel like um, is really important for me in my work. It almost sometimes feels like the art is always being made to create the pedagogy. Like I'm kind of embodying the student and figuring out like, oh, what are these practices that are working so that I can then write a curriculum for it. So it's a huge influence. And um, yeah, maybe the <laughs> maybe the most important inspiration. I don't know. Yeah, it's, it can be a way of healing in itself, which I did not expect. Um, I really didn't. And it's not they're not separate from each other. It's this process yeah and healing has a big part to play in your works uh <laughs> which we heard a lot about of um someone mentioned in the comments um i'm inspired to slow down and be more intuitive love not worried about making mistakes with my webs no mistakes as raya says uh uh and i think something that spoke to me that you said brandy was when you said like trust yourself like trust yourself to be able to create something, to be able to accomplish something. Uh, And I think that's a big thing, especially when you're exploring things that are really intimidating or really emotional, uh, to just trust yourself to be able to make those things. And that's something I think I have been working on personally, like uh, when trying to take art seriously is like, I need to trust myself that I can make things and it doesn't have to be perfect. Uh, And so I really responded to that. Yeah, absolutely. I think yeah the intimidation is is major especially using a new medium or just feeling really overwhelmed and also self-judgment I think is it's something that I know I struggle with I'm sure a lot of people do too of how is this going to look is this going to be presented in a certain way and whatnot but the best way is just to start doing it and you have to do it for yourself first really and and just one little step at a time uh So we talked about teaching, healing. One thing that I wanted to bring up, because it does figure, you both mentioned these things, but uh, residencies uh, seem to have a big part in terms of your creation process and sort of uh, doing new things. So do you want to talk about sort of how residencies have sort of helped you or guided you? Sure. Um. Yeah, I mean, I think, well, for me, I'm based in Brooklyn, and a lot of times um, the residency experience is an opportunity for me to be fully 
um, immersed in nature. And that's a big part of it for me. And then the other part, I think, is like uh, the communal aspect of being able to work with other people in residency, whether that means that we're like directly working on a project together or alongside each other. I think we're all creating together and then what emerges from that is something that's of us all and so I really like exploring that and being able to be back in that um, space where the like we're sharing creativity with each other yeah yeah and I've always wanted to do residencies and I love traveling and there's so many options some more affordable than others, but it's it's a great way to connect to people from all over the world and either finding residencies that are local, but then people coming to your city or state or you, you know, going abroad, et cetera, and um, being in completely different environments. Like I talked a lot about that, my work of being very in tune with the surroundings and then creating work that's that's either directly or indirectly based on the materials or the, the atmosphere of that. So yeah, and they can be, you know, it can be a week long residency, it could be a few days, or it can be a month. Like, even in some cities, there's, I mean, there's tons of residencies in Iceland and, and Mexico. And so there's some to choose from, but, and a lot of them do so many different mediums too. And I love visiting other residencies as well. Like, even if I'm not part of it, you can just go and, and look at the shows and see what people are doing and connect with them. You can have writers and dancers in the same space. So, you know, it's, it's great. It's yeah, Andy, when we spoke, <laughs> when we spoke, you um, like you were talking a bit about choosing specific locations for different parts of the grief process you're studying, which I found so amazing. Um, do you want to share more about that, or can you tell us more about it? Yeah, yeah, sure. I think sometimes, I'll, like in London, I kind of knew that I wanted to work on this project going in with the anger stage, but then some, it's when I land. And then I think at first, you know, like, I don't know what I'm going to work on, but then something will click. Um, and I'm thinking about doing a residency in Japan for the acceptance stage. And that's my own personal relationship with that country and obviously with my mother. So, but yeah, I think it's sometimes planned and sometimes not. And, and it's a way for me to organize my own thoughts. Cause sometimes I've got tons of different thoughts and different, so many different projects that I, want to be able to focus and then have trust that eventually all of it will come together as a whole. So I'm thinking about that with this project as well. But um, yeah, I think it'll be interesting to see how all of these different cultures and different atmospheres and countries and works will be put together in one complete cohesive way that will be universal of what I'm, the message that I'm trying to say. Excited. Yeah, I mean, I think that space, like spaces do have a big part in both of your works. Uh, and I've, I've also asked you about residencies because I've never been on one. I'd love to try one because I think part of, yeah, like exploring your creativity and finding ways to, to do new things is to sort of change up the space you're in. I have one place to create right now. I don't have a studio. Uh, but hopefully one day I'd have a studio, one day I'd go on residencies. And so I'm interested in how that makes work evolve. Um, and so it's fascinating to me to hear that from from both of you of like how it transforms things. Uh, Definitely do it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> at some yeah. point. I don't think I'm there yet, uh, yeah. <laughs> but uh, we'll get there. Um. And uh, I had another comment. Oh, yeah. Um, I saw earlier someone said, uh, so one thing that I like about uh, many of the people that we've had on Textile Medley so far is everybody's so multidisciplinary. We all like do, you know, weaving is one thing and fiber in general, but there's also dancing. And uh, one person mentioned, I love the idea of collages of inspiration. It's like having ongoing vision boards. And I think both of you had sort of elements of collage that sort of came up. Um, so I don't know if you want to talk about like multidisciplinary stuff or the collage or vision board, but I just, some thoughts there, if you want to jump off. Yeah, that process really helped me. And I really, 
learned a lot from Santo St. Martin's in London because they have a very particular way of approaching design, ultimately as an art form, which is what I really relate to and being experimental with it and that the collages are, are quick intuitive ways for you to combine your research and then create these the three-dimensional forms. So, and they're a lot of times they can be kind of art pieces in themselves too. Um, and the vision boards and combining that. So, and sometimes I'll kind of think, okay, well maybe I'll skip a step, but then I really understand why those steps are there to help with, with the design. And yeah, so I, I love doing the collages. I think they, then combining the drawings with just cutting out and feeling free with your research images. Yeah, I, I agree that collage is like an incredible medium for thinking like that the die the print die project that I did was for years was mainly collage and I do other collage work and I think it's just like uh, the most accessible way to dive into making in the sense of like you have something and you can really quickly transform it and then see it as something else um, and so I feel like that's just a mechanism to keep me fluid and reflect back at me that the only constant is change. Um, so I really value it. And then I think I, as doing it, I see it on a broader level of like, I see kind of my whole life as like a always moving collage, like the, the teaching, the healing, the art making, and like any interaction I have um, is creating that constant change or transformation. All right, we are coming up on time, unfortunately, uh, but we could talk forever. <laughs> so much to talk about. Uh, but I want to thank you for joining us uh, for this talk. It has been really amazing, and your work really complements each other so well. Uh, we hope to do textile medleys again next summer because uh, I think it's been a lovely series. Uh, and I have to now pop up some contact info. All right. So if you want to reach out to Alex or Brandy or, of course, Intertwine Arts, I have some contact information that I'm flashing up here. Uh, shameless plug. Uh, so this is the end of our textile medley series. Um, but we do have another talk called Disability Hacks, Strategies for Arts Adaptations on September 19th. That will be talking more about teaching and working with people with disabilities. Specifically, uh, we had a talk that was about geriatric populations. Now we're focusing on just adult populations and teaching. Um, the two people who are part of it are both studio owners and weavers, Chiaki O'Brien and uh, Yael Batia Hatch. So it should be very cool. Um, but I wanna thank you all for joining us again for Textile Medley um, and Brandy and Alex for presenting. Uh, and we hope to see you all at a future talk uh, and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>